Amen. Amen. Well, again, welcome to Arizona Community Church. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you. My name is Bill. I am the teaching pastor and want to welcome you, especially if you're new. If you're new in the last six months, come to the coffee after the service today. I will be over there. It's, it's our guest coffee. It's just right across the way. It's going to be a lot of fun. And Dina is back from Kosovo. Dina, stand up real quick and just say hi to everybody. We'll, we'll have a report from her, but we unleashed Dina on Kosovo and... Uh, um, so that, I'm excited to hear the reports about that. Well, we are in the middle of a series on heaven, and I hope it has been a blessing to you guys. Has it been somewhat of a blessing, I hope? Um, good, good, good. I'm so glad. If you've missed any of the messages, I encourage you to, you can find those online. We've covered a lot of ground thus far. Um, week number one, we talked about, and I think this is the most important message out of all of them. We talked about the sufficiency of scripture with regard to the topic of heaven. Remember, there's a million books being put out on the market today. Everybody's saying that they're going to heaven and back. And we talked about that first week, the sufficiency of Scripture um, when it comes to the doctrine of heaven. Week number two, we talked about the difference between the intermediate and the eternal state. The intermediate state is where believers are now. They are in the presence of the Lord awaiting the resurrection of their bodies uh, in which we will be united with them um, and we will enter into the eternal state which is the new heavens and the new earth. In weeks three and four, we spent some time talking about our resurrection bodies and we're gonna continue that today. And today is the most fun day. Is that good? Does that sound good? Because today we get to answer the fun, fun questions. This is gonna be, this is one of the sermons that, um, that I really look forward to preaching because it's all fun. It's all fun. So you guys ready? You guys ready to have some fun this morning? I mean it. Your hearts are going to be encouraged. They really, really are. Okay, so one of the defining characteristics of the new heaven and the new earth is the lifting of the divine curse that we see in the book of Genesis. So when Adam and Eve sinned, folks, and this is critical, this is important to understand, not only was everyone affected, but everything was affected. In other words, creation was put under a divine curse when Adam and Eve sinned. And we read about that curse in Genesis chapter 3. I said this is a fun sermon, and then I'm starting with a curse, so it's kind of a bummer. But church, I present to you this morning the Word of God. Hear the Word of God. Let it encourage your hearts. Genesis chapter 3, 17 through 19, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat. Um, all the days of your life, thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Amen. What this means, folks, this verse is significant. You know why this passage is significant? Because before the fall of mankind there were no weeds or poisonous plants or thorns or thistles. The soil was perfect, the water was perfect, the air was perfect, the trees and vegetation were perfect. The animal world would have been perfect too. All of the animals that God originally created would have lived together in perfect harmony. This includes the dinosaurs, and people always struggle with the dinosaurs. Listen, folks, the dinosaurs were created on day six, right, when, uh, the, when the other land animals were created, and they were wiped out in the flood. Okay, except for the, there, were, there would have been some representations of the dinosaurs on the ark. But after they got off the ark, those dinosaur species would have died out. We would, either would have hunted them and killed them, or they just would have died out naturally. So the dinosaurs aren't a mystery. I believe in a young earth, and I believe in a six-day little, little creation. It completely works out. God created the dinosaurs. They wiped out the majority of them in the flood. The few that made it onto the ark were representing all the dinosaurs. They died out after. That's simply how it happened. Um, the biblical account of how it happens, the, regardless of what they're teaching in, in the universities and teaching our children, that's the biblical account of it. Anyway, that side note, I didn't mean to go there. I'm sorry. You forgive me? Okay. All right. So um, imagine a world where there is no curse. Now, you can't because all you and I know is a cursed world. But let me just tell you this. Um, the world that was and the world that's going to be is, if you're an environmentalist, it's the world you've always dreamed of. It is the world you've always dreamed of. Now, as I get older, I've come to appreciate being outdoors more. You know, don't you? Um, I, the outdoors to me are becoming more and more precious as I get older. But um, in the original creation, Adam and Eve would have cared over God's creation with, and here's the key, with great ease and delight. 
It would have been easy to care over God's creation. It would have been delightful to care over God's creation. But all of that was lost when Adam and Eve sinned. Now, if this were the end of the story, it would read like a Greek tragedy. No offense. But it would read like a Greek tragedy. Dean is Greek, of course. Um, But the good news is, this is not the end of the story. Why? Because God is merciful. God is merciful not only to redeem you and me, but to redeem creation itself. As a matter of fact, in the book of Romans, it says creation, it longs to be redeemed. It longs to be set free. So God is merciful. He is not only going to redeem you and me, he is going to redeem the creation as well. And this is significant because if you and I are living in a redeemed creation, a renewed and redeemed creation, that's going to have a bearing on us for all eternity. So God is good. When we say God is gracious, he is gracious. He is very, very gracious. But again, one of the defining characteristics of the new heaven and the new, the new earth is the lifting of the curse. And we read about this in Revelation 22, 3. No longer will there be anything a curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. All you and I have ever known is what it's like to live under a divine curse. Do you realize that? That's all you've ever known from the womb all the way to the tomb, all you, are, all you will have ever known in this lifetime is what it's like to live under a curse. Now, some of you, you can relate to this because you go, man, have you ever woken up one, on a morning or just where you're going through your day and it goes, man, I feel like I'm cursed. You ever, you ever said that? I think we probably have all said it at different times in our life. It's like, man, I feel, just feel like I'm cursed. That's because you are. <laughs> you are living under a curse. If you've ever thought it, that's because it's true. What this means, folks, is everything is incredibly more difficult now. Incredibly more difficult now. Living now is like trying to sail a boat into incredibly an incredibly um, strong headwind. If you've ever done that, if you've ever ridden a bike, sailed a boat, even driven a car into an incredibly strong headwind, you know how difficult that can be. Well, in the new heaven and the new earth, that headwind will become a tailwind. As a result, everything is going to get much easier, much better, and more delightful. Amen? Amen. And this has radical implications for you and for me for all eternity. So let's begin to talk about some of those implications. And here's what we're going to talk about today. You guys ready? We're going to talk about food, we're going to talk about animals, and we're going to talk about what we're doing in the new heaven and the new earth. So you guys ready? (laughs) I'm not, I'm going to break the number one rule of preaching. And that is you never mention food. Because the minute I mention food, what does everybody do? What are we going to have for lunch? Where are we going? Okay, we should go here. We should go there. Next thing you know, sermon's over and you guys are off and running. Okay, we have alluded to, I have alluded to during this series that in fact there will be food in the new heaven and the new earth. But what you need to know is the food that you have known in this lifetime is food produced from a cursed ground. All the food that you have ever eaten, every meal you have ever eaten, as wonderful as it might have been, has been a cursed meal. In the new heaven and the new earth, all that's going to change. In the age to come, we will eat at banquet tables, feasting on food that has been cultivated under the divine blessing of God rather than the divine curse of God. So let me ask you a question. What is your favorite food? Oh boy. How many of you are fruit people? You love fruit. How many fruit people in here? How many of you are nuts? You don't want to raise your hand for that. (laughs) How many of you, honestly, you're salad people? How many salad people in here? How many, you're a pizza person, pizza people? How many of you are sweet people? This is my category. I am a sweet tooth. I, I have a sweet tooth. I really, really do. Folks, Um, And again, I'm breaking the cardinal rule. Food is one of the great pleasures that God has given us during this lifetime. See, God didn't just create food so that we could live, although he did. He created food so that we could enjoy it. It is one of the great pleasures that God has given to us in this lifetime. And so one of the, this is going to sound silly, but people wrote in questions like, is there going to be chocolate in heaven? (laughs) Yes, there is. And that's not a fun, it's a funny question, but it's a true question. I have no doubt that in the new heaven and the new earth, we are going to eat. As a matter of fact, there's a really awesome verse in the Old Testament. It's Isaiah, who lived 600 years before the time of Christ. In talking about the age to come, he wrote this. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people, and this is really interesting because it, 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 it puts God as the chef. 
on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all his people a feast of rich food. What do you think of when you think of rich food? Oh, man, I don't know. That, that's endless. We could have fun with that right there. A feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine, well-refined. Does that sound good? <laughs> that sounds good. I don't know about you. That sounds beyond good to me. Food is one of the great pleasures that God has given us in this lifetime. It serves a very practical purpose in this lifetime, but it goes beyond that. It is a pleasure, and it is a pleasure that we see being demonstrated in the new heaven and the new earth, where there are banquet tables in which we are going to eat and feast like never before. And again, you're not just going to feast. You are going to feast from food that has been cultivated under a new heaven and a new earth that is under the divine blessing of God. But it doesn't stop there. Many of you love to cook. How many of you love to cook? Not everybody loves to cook, but some of you love it, and you're good at it, and I praise you, because we all bless your name, you know, at the church picnic, and if you uh, just, it's amazing, if you've ever gone to the Cambodian potluck, I shouldn't even say this, because I'm letting you into the greatest secret at this church. The Cambodian church that meets on our campus has a once a year Thanksgiving potluck, and it is like heaven. It is like heaven, because those ladies love to cook. Eating isn't the only pleasure we derive from food. Cooking is also a great pleasure for many, for many. Folks, there is no reason to think that cooking and creating new and exquisite meals won't, it will be a part of the new heaven and the new earth. It will be a part of the, a place where God says there are going to be banquet tables. There are going to be banquet tables. You know, one of the tough things about living in this generation is the extinction of animals and plants. We have scientists say, well, there's species of plants and animals that have been extinct for a long time. I really truly believe that in the new heaven and the new earth, all of those plant species that have gone extinct, the good ones, will be renewed and restored. Not only that, it's very possible that there's going to be new species of plants and fruits and vegetables in the new heaven and the new earth that you and I We'll get to not only eat, but some of you who love to cook will get to, get to make exquisite meals and to experiment with and to do awesome things. And imagine, and I really do mean this, imagine the new heaven and new earth saying, later today we're going to all meet for an exquisite banquet at, at this place, at this time. In the presence of the Lord, we'll feast together and we'll break bread together. Does that sound good? It sounds very, very good to me. I know that there are many of you who love to garden. How many of you are people that love to put your hands in the soil? You love to grow things. You love to do things and garden and work outside. Absolutely. Some of you love to do it. You know good at it, right? What is it called? It's the green thumb. Yeah, some of you have a green thumb. Others for you, it's purple, right? Because, you know, uh, anyway. There is also, folks, no reason to think that, that gardening and working in the soils will not be a part of the new heaven and the new earth. As Adam and Eve cared over and cultivated God's original creation, so too will we, with resurrected bodies, partake in similar activities in heaven. In the age to come, you will never eat a cursed meal again. You will eat perfect food with perfect people. By the way, what's one of the things that ruins any good meal? Yeah, it's when you're eating it with somebody that you're mad at, right? Right? You look across, you're like, this food looks great. And you look up and see that person, you're like, oh, this, this meal's just been ruined, right? Because you and I are at war with our strife. But here's the point. You will eat perfect food in the new age. In the new, new heaven and the new earth, you will eat perfect food with perfect people. There will be no strife whatsoever. And you will do this all in the presence of the Lord God Almighty. Under his care, his protection, his blessing, so yes, there will be magnificent, magnificent food in heaven. We will create with it. We will grow it. We will eat it. We will have banquets. We will feast together and fellowship together with God for all eternity. I don't know about you, but that sounds good to me. Now this, this leads to a related question. Since there are going to be plants in the new heaven and the new earth, vegetation, fruits, and soils, and all of this sort of thing, since there's going to be nature in the new heaven and the new earth, does this mean that there will be animals in the age to come? And of course, this was one of the number one questions that you all wrote in about. Are there going to be animals in heaven? Oh, this is an important question. 
The Bible has a lot to say about animals. Like food itself, animals are truly a gift from God. See, animals were given to us for practical purposes. Animals help us all the time. They help us till the soil, and they help us, you know, animals do so much for us. But animals transcend that. Animals are truly a gift from God. They bring pleasure to our lives, don't they? They're not just helpful to us. They bring pleasure to us. God himself has used animals for the advancement of his kingdom down through the centuries. God used ravens to feed Elijah in 1 Kings 17. God used a great fish to swallow Jonah, right, in the book of Jonah. God used a donkey to speak to Balaam, Numbers chapter 22. God even used a fish with two coins in its mouth to teach the apostle Peter a lesson, right, about God's provision, and that's in Matthew chapter 17. Animals, by the way, are even mentioned in the Ten Commandments. The day of rest wasn't just for people. It was for our animals. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 10. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Now listen to this. It mentions nothing but human beings except for one little caveat. On it you, you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, this is interesting, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. Everybody and everything is to rest. The Bible even says that a righteous man has regard for his animals, the righteous care for the needs of their animals, but the kindest acts of the wicked are cruel. You can learn a lot about the heart of a person, how they treat animals, can't you? right? You can learn a lot about a person by how they treat animals, and you can even learn something about a person by how animals respond to people sometimes in some cases, right? Does it ever concern you when, the, when you know, well, anyway, we won't go there, but um, you, you, you truly can. So will there be animals in heaven? Well, Isaiah speaks of a future time in which animals will live in perfect harmony with one another. And we see this in Isaiah chapter 11. Now, some think that this is referring to the future millennium. Others think this is the new heaven and the new earth. It doesn't matter. It's in the future, and there's animals there. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion shall be fattened, and the fattened calf together. And the little child shall lead them. This is how much harmony there's going to be. The cow and the bear shall graze. The young shall lie down together. And the lion, I forgot to highlight that, the lion shall uh, eat straw with the ox. The nursing child shall play with the hole, in the hole of the cobra. And the wean child shall put his hand in the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in, uh, in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So yes, animals are going to be a part of the new heaven and the new earth. Absolutely. Now, like I said about plants, there are many plants that have been extinct that I believe that we're going to see in the new heaven and the new earth. This also goes for animals. You know, one of the bummers about living in this day and age is is we hear about all the animals that once existed that we never got to see or experience. And we go, oh, that's too bad. They're gone. And we hear on the news, they're gone forever. No, they're not. They're gone forever if you're not going to be in the new heaven and the new earth. But if you are going to be a part of the new heaven and the new earth, I have no doubt we're going to see those animals again. I brought, and I've said this before, what was the purpose of dinosaurs in the original creation? Why did God create dinosaurs? I don't totally know, but I think a real practical reason would have been that there would have been so much vegetation that these giant animals would have served and helped mankind as we cared for God's creation, as they consumed these things, as they assumed the vegetation. And that we may need that help in the new heavens and the new earth. These animals will be there to help us and we will govern them and we'll we'll work with them. It'll be amazing. Perhaps, and this is fun to think about, do you ever think that when, when God created all the animals that he could have created a ton more? I mean, God is so creative about the animal kingdom and the animal world. But you wonder if in the original creation he said, that's enough for now. But at the end of time, I'm going to create, uh, there's species of animals God's thinking that I have created in my mind that I'm going to bring to. So my point is, is that there might be species of animals that, that never have existed, that might exist in the new heaven and the new earth. You think dogs are awesome? Just imagine what could be in the new heaven and the new earth. Um, That's really exciting. Is that not exciting to you guys to think about this sort of thing? It's going to be incredible. Now this raises the specific question, and this is the one everybody wants to know. What's the question everybody wants to know? Are my pets 
going to be in heaven. Now, I want to just remind you that you may not want everybody's pets in heaven because remember your neighbor's dog that you don't like all that much? You may not want that dog in heaven, right? By the way, it is often assumed that people's attachment to animals is simply a modern-day phenomenon. I hear this where, you, where people go, well, it's just the 21st century Americans. You guys are obsessed with animals, and it wasn't always like that. That is not true. That is not true. Um, we see, history shows that animals have always had a special place in the lives of human beings. Remember in the story in the Old Testament, David commits sin with Bathsheba. And you're going, what in the world does this have to do with animals? You'll see here in a second. So David commits adultery with Bathsheba, and then he kills her husband. His name was Uriah. And, and he, didn't, he lived in an unrepentant state for a while. It's almost like he didn't realize what he'd done until the prophet Nathan came to him and confronted him. Here's where it's really interesting. Nathan, the prophet Nathan, used the story of a man with a little lamb as the basis to confront David. So church, hear the word of God. Hear the word of God. The Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up. Now listen to this. Doesn't this sound like 21st century Americans with our pets? And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat his morsels and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. And this is, I love the last part of this, and it was like a daughter to him. It was like a daughter to him. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever had a pet, and that pet becomes like a family member to you? Yeah, of course we have. We all have. We all have a tender, special place in our hearts for pets. As a matter of fact, I'm sure that there's some of you now, it's stirring emotions and tears start coming to your eyes as you think of pets that maybe you grew up with, that you um, enjoy, that brought such blessings to you, perhaps even protected you in life. So again, this raises the question, will my pets be in heaven? Well, here's the deal. I can't take you to a chapter and verse that says our pets are in heaven. That verse doesn't exist. But I don't think that it is out of the question that pets can and will inhabit the new heaven and the new earth, but we won't know for certain until that day. If you ask me to take you to chapter and verse, I can't do it. But everything I see in the character of God lends, leads me to think that there's no reason he can't do it. Many of you know this woman, Joni, Joni Erickson Tata. Do you guys know her? If you don't know her, she's an amazing Christian woman. She was in a diving accident as a child where she broke her neck and she ended up in a wheelchair and that just was the basis for her to draw closer to God and do great things. But she wrote this. If God brings our pets back to life, it wouldn't surprise me. It would be just like him. It would be totally in keeping with his generous character. Exorbitant, excessive, extravagant in grace after grace. Isn't that an awesome quote? Isn't that an awesome quote? Folks, I can tell you this. Heaven will be heaven either way. If our pets are there or not. But I can tell you, I have no doubt that animals are going to be a significant part of the new heaven and the new earth. Now, at this point, I want to move to this question, because this, is, this ties into the animal and the plant world as well. What are we going to do in the new heaven and the new earth? What in the world are we going to do for all eternity? Now, be honest. Every one of us in this room has thought this question. Won't heaven eventually get boring? Right? I mean, even this life, as great as it is, it starts getting boring after a while, doesn't it? And you, there comes a point where it's like, I've done everything there is to do. What else is there to do? I've traveled the world. I've done this. I've done that. I, you know, I've done everything. What are we going to do for eternity? Won't we, get, won't we eventually run out of things to do? But what you need to know is that this won't ever be the case. Why won't this ever be the case? Well, we know this because God himself is infinite. You are spending time in the presence of an infinite God. If God were finite, then yes, things would eventually get boring, but God is not finite. He is infinite, which means there will be no end to the joy, pleasure, and goodness you and I will experience in the new heaven and the new earth. How do I know that? Because the Bible says this time, and again, Psalm 1611, in your presence there is fullness of joy. It's not just some joy. It'll be the fullest joy, the most rich and awesome joy you've ever experienced. And it'll be yours for eternity. And at your right hand, here's the deal, are pleasures forevermore. 
eternity in the new heaven and the new earth will be marked by pleasures forevermore. And you go, well, how could there be pleasures forevermore? Because God is infinite, and there is no limit to the amount of pleasures he can give or when he can give them. So what exactly will we do in the new heaven and the new earth? Well, the Bible gives us some clues. Revelation chapter 7, verse 15 says, Therefore, uh, therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. Now, we're going to serve God, okay? We are going to serve God. Now that you go, well, that sounds kind of boring. What does that mean? Hold your horses. Just hold your horses on that. Revelation 22, 3 says this, there will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and the lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. And the other translations say we will worship him. And then just a couple of verses later, it says this in verse 22, 5, there will be no more night. They will not need the light of the lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord will give them light, and they will, here's the key, we will reign with him. So we will serve God, worship God, reign with him in the new heaven and the new earth. What does this mean? We are going to be given authority to help reign and rule over God's new and renewed creation. Now we get a glimpse of this from some of the parables of the Jesus, uh, that Jesus told. So Luke chapter 19, Jesus tells the parable of a nobleman that goes away to receive a kingdom, right? And when he leaves, he leaves his servants in charge and he gives them each minas or money in this case. He gives them minas and he says, invest these while I'm gone and when I come back, I'm going to see what each of you have done. Now, Luke 19 is a very long passage. The parable of the 10 minas is a long passage, but I just want to read one little excerpt from it. And here it is, Luke chapter six, uh, 19. The first, that is the first servant, came before him, that is the nobleman that came back after receiving a kingdom, saying, Lord, your mina has made 10 more, 10 minus more. And he, that is the nobleman that has returned, and obviously that's Christ, he said to him, well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in very little, you shall have authority over 10 cities. In the new heaven and the new earth, we will be given authority to help rule over God's perfect creation. There will be a new Jerusalem, and that doesn't exclude the fact that that will be the only city in the new heaven and new earth. There may be cities all over the earth on other planets as well. And we will reign and rule over those cities. In other words, we will have work to do and tasks to complete, divine assignments to accomplish. Imagine coming into the temple of God and God saying to you, come over here. Jesus saying, come over here, I have an assignment for you. And you say, well, what kind of assignments will we have? Many of us, I think, will work with the soils. We'll be part of the growing and the cultivating of the beautiful creation that God has created. Other, others of us will participate in the arts. Others of us who love food will create with food and develop the banquets. Other, others of us will love exploration. Yet others of you who love animals, how many animal lovers in, in here? I think that many of the divine assignments in the new heaven and new earth will have to do with animals. We want you to take these animals and do this, and go do this, and help here. It's going to be a divine economy in which God is the one giving the assignments. And the assignments are going to be rich and awesome and fun and beautiful. Is this exciting, you guys? I hope it is. Listen, in, in his book, Heaven, Randy Alcorn says this, work in heaven won't be frustrating or fruitless. Instead, it will involve lasting accomplishments. I love this. Listen, unhindered by decay and fatigue, enhanced by unlimited resources, will approach our work with enthusiasm, with the enthusiasm that we bring to our favorite sport or hobby in this lifetime. What is it that you love to do in this lifetime? Whatever it is you love to do in this lifetime, multiply that times a million, and when God gives you assignments in heaven, that's how awesome it is going to be to fulfill those assignments. You're going to have unlimited resources and time to do the things that God has called us to do in the new heaven and the new earth. It is a divine economy in a perfect creation before a glorious God who is directing us to use our gifts to serve him in every way. Folks, if you think you're going to be bored in heaven, you are not. It is going to be one pleasure after another as you serve, worship, and reign with the risen Christ. Anthony Hokema, the great Anthony Hokema, he said this, the possibilities that now rise before us boggle the mind. They literally boggle the mind. Will there be better Beethovens on the new earth, better Rembrandts, better Raphaels? Yes, there will. Some of you, I said, you love the arts. You love to express yourself through the arts. There's no reason that you can't do this in the new heaven, in the new earth. 
Others of us are sports people. I do think that we will use our bodies for physical activities. There will be games and activities like that in the new heaven and the new earth. And I don't mean to trivialize this because we are, uh, we are answering trivial questions. And like I said, when I started this series, I thought, well, we'll answer the trivial questions to get to the important ones. But I learned something in this process. And that is this, the trivial questions matter. Because God has created us as physical beings in a physical universe, and he says that he is going to renew this. He's going to resurrect us, and he is going to renew. There's going to be a renewed new heaven and new earth, and we're going to exist on it. So these questions are not as trivial as we might think they are, and they're sure fun to think about, aren't they? They are sure fun to think about. Scientists say that we as humans are currently using about 10% of our brain capacity. I think for me that's about 3%. But imagine what it will be like when you have 100% of your brain's capacity at work in a world with no sin, with endless resources at your disposal under the divine direction of God himself. Just imagine. Just imagine. The late, great Ray Stedman, and Pastor Greg actually worked at Peninsula Bible Church with Ray Stedman, didn't you? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Ray Stedman says this, there will be new planets to develop, new principles to discover, new joys to experience. Every moment of eternity will be an adventure in discovery. You know how fun it is to discover new things? You know when you discover something new and you're like, that is awesome. I can't believe we discovered this. Folks, that's what is heaven is going to be like. I got to keep the pace here. Okay, I'm going to wrap up here. Of this you can be sure, you won't ever be bored again. Fullness of joy, pleasures forevermore. By the way, in heaven there will be a lot of jobs we won't have to do. Amen? Let's face it, not all jobs are good, which means um, we are not going to need police in heaven, security in heaven, doctors in heaven, garbage collectors in heaven. Um, we are going to be freed from assignments that we didn't, to, freed to do assignments we didn't even know existed. In other words, instead of doing jobs centered around the effects and consequences of sin, which there will be none in the new heaven and the new earth, we will be able to focus all of our time, energy, and energy on discovery, exploration, creativity, the arts and the sciences, tilling the soil, growing things, and eating together in the fellowship of God Almighty. Amen? Um, this also means we will continue to learn in heaven. People go, well, will we learn in heaven. You will continue to learn in heaven. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. You will be able to dig deep into things that have no bottom and soar to heights with things that have no ceilings. You will be learning and growing. We will spend eternity having the privilege of searching out the unsearchable. We will continue to learn, explore, discover, and uncover new things about God, about creation, about the animal kingdom, and about each other for all eternity. If you think you're smart now, just wait. As a wise person once said, in heaven you will be the genius you've always believed yourself to be. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Listen, I end with a question today. I talked earlier about the parable of the ten minas, and that obviously is a story that Christ himself has gone to receive the kingdom, which he has, and he is going to return, and he's going to reward us for our faithfulness in this lifetime. So I simply ask you, are you using the gifts that God has given you right now in such a way that God will be able to greatly reward you in the age to come? Folks, life is short. Hold the things of this world loosely. Give your life away. This is the call of the gospel. The gospel is not a call to save your life. It is a call to lose your life. No greater love than this one when one man lay his life down for another. Give your life away while you can because your life will be over before you know it. Amen? Amen. Let me pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, God, for your word and for the expectation of what is to come. God, we can't even scratch the surface here. Paul says the things that he saw um, are that he wasn't even permitted to tell. They're, um, they're, they're beyond human, uh, our wildest imaginations. But God, as we peer into eternity, even a little bit, God, our hearts are set afla aflame and afire. So God, as we leave here, let us leave here encouraged. God, let us give our lives away. We love you. We thank you. We pray these things in your son's name who is our savior. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. We'll see you here next week. Come to our coffee right now if you're new. Come to our coffee.